What's that? I like them just fine, I guess. Which ones do you like though? I mean, at that point, does it really matter all that much? I mean, we'll put lipstick on a pig, aren't we? <laughs> How am I supposed to do that paper? I don't know what can. <laughs> uh, all right, here we are. <clears throat> so first of all, um, I normally don't go back and listen to uh, to the lectures I record. Why would I do that? Why would I listen to him? I hate that guy. But um, I did happen to go back because somebody mentioned something else in one of the lectures, and I wanted to make sure that you know, it was accurate which it was, so I'm not correcting that. But in the process of that, I realized that throughout the entirety we were talking about this slide, I kept referring to this person here as Baines. That's not his name, that's Edouard Bernay. So if, you, if you're looking into his book, you're not gonna find it if you're looking for Baines. It's Bernay. All right, so we were about, uh, here ish. Okay. All right. Um, last time we left off about here talking about the difference between hard tactics and soft tactics and about which of these uh, generally is most often used and which of them is most often successful. Uh, when we left off at that point, of course, we were about a slide ahead. Uh, and this coming from a particular study might lead you to believe. We tend to have better results with one tactic over another. Uh, but I do want to point out that it also very much depends on a person, right? <clears throat> There's a reason why we call human interaction chemistry, right? So two people get together. Sometimes you end up with volatile situations. Sometimes you end up with a more copacetic kind of situation. And you can't always rely on one tactic over another to work. Like, for example, um, oh, you know what, actually, before I get to the example, I will say I teach a lot of really weird stuff to students all the time, all right? This is cybersecurity. So sometimes we talk about how criminals operate and some of the things that they do. And to be honest with you, uh, yeah, uh, there are plenty of people who have concerns about some of the things that, uh, like, should we be teaching people to do this? Well, obviously, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think it was important. But I have far fewer concerns about teaching students how to pick locks uh, and brute force passwords and find vulnerabilities in sites to exploit or hack MMOs and stuff like that. I have far fewer compunction about those things than I do about this. So let me reiterate once again, uh, this is not the kind of thing you want to try and play around with on your own, unless you're actually doing it in some kind of legal or ethical um, um, bounds, right? Um, which is to say, all right, the reason I'm saying this at all is because we have students in here that aren't in the cybersecurity track. If you're in the cybersecurity track, we focus fairly heavily in uh, other courses, of course, on ethics. And if you're not from that track, you may not have heard that. So point is, is that there's a difference between influencing people. We influence people all the time. You can't help but influence people if you're around people. It will influence them. There's nothing wrong with that. But manipulation and influence are two different things. One of them has a distinctive uh, taint of non-consent to it, right? So obviously that's out of bounds. It is always wrong to do anything that removes a person's agency from themselves, their ability to act within their own self-interest and they're under their own uh, authority, right? To control their own self. So I won't say any more on the matter except don't try this at home. But... All right, so the example. Um, there are cases, most of the time, if you're using hard tactics, it's going to leave people with a bad taste in their mouth, right? If you try to go with a tactic that is browbeating them uh, or intimidating them or something like that, they might acquiesce and do what you want them to do, but they're not going to feel good about it afterwards. They're not going to feel very uh, willing to help uh, if you need something in addition to that. Whereas with soft tactics, again, it depends on chemistry. You know, some people, they really take to softer tactics. 
something that puts the ball in their court. They're acting of their own interest. It's that sense of agency. Nobody likes to have that feeling like it's being taken away. So if you use a softer tactic, they might be more willing to do that and even to continue to help afterwards. But there are, of course, other people uh, that if you make an inspirational appeal, they just see it as pathetic and then they're not willing to help you. So it really comes down to, to that, how well you can sell these tactics more than anything else. It's possible to have success and to make people feel uncomfortable. If you've ever heard, look, think about all of our presidents throughout history, right? Most of them very charismatic and they got where they got because they tended, if we think of like, uh, all right, so um, whether or not you voted for any of these presidents, uh, just think for a moment, what was the appeal of Donald Trump, right? A lot of people found his speeches to be inspirational, personally appealing to them recruiting them on a mission to save America, make America great again. Obama, very much the same with his supporters, inspired them, you know, the, the hope and change message and all of that. None of this was, well, let's look at some of our unsuccessful presidential candidates, right? If we look at uh, Mitt Romney and his binder full of women, right? That was a soundbite because it sounds kind of funny, but ultimately why would a, a candidate like that or a John Kerry fail? Well, if you look at some of their messaging, right? They had ideas, but they were all legitimating. They were saying, you should vote for me because I have a plan, because I know what to do, because it's the right and rational thing to do, and so on. It might be true. I'm not here, again, to equivocate on politics, but it is less inspiring, inspiring to action. But other presidents who had very successful careers, now in the case of LBJ, right, who, who did have an election, but of course was not themselves initially elected. He was a vice president serving under a charismatic president who got where he got because of a change in technology, right? We already talked about how technology can kind of change the game. On radio broadcasts in the John F. Kennedy versus Nixon race, those listening to that radio broadcast gave Nixon the edge because he sounded better over the radio. What he was saying made more sense and was more appealing to people. But television was a fairly new thing. And those watching those debates on television gave the edge to JFK because on TV, he was far more charismatic. I mean, Nixon looked like a rumpled, lumpy suit on TV. So it was really all about that message, but that's not who I'm talking about. I'm actually talking about the vice president candidate LBJ it was very, influential and effective, he probably would not have been elected on his own at first because you may not realize this, but people did not like him very much. And it wasn't because of his politics. He was personally acerbic, right? And why is that? Because he made liberal use of hard tactics, right? Much the same as the uh, season one winner of Survivor did. You want to watch that one? Uh, Richard, the winner of that season, he won because he controlled the social game. And he did it the same way that LBJ did. He made people uncomfortable by invading their personal space. Do you feel more psychological pressure? I certainly do, right? LBJ had a habit. Number one, he'd call people in the old office with the bathroom door open, and he would take meetings while he was taking a shit. Who does that? The boss, that's who, right? He's making the rules. He's setting the social agenda. He defines norms. When he would talk to people, he would talk loud and very close to them. He would pop their personal bubble. And why? He's setting the social norms. He's the one who makes those rules. Did people walk away from that saying, boy, that LBJ, I sure do like him. No, but they definitely walked away acquiescing to his wishes. All right, so uh, as I said before, this is something that you do if you're going to be a penetration tester. It is a specialty in terms of cybersecurity, right? There are people who their entire job is to social engineer, but it's also one of those things where everyone kind of does it a little bit to a certain extent or another. These are part of security assessments. And uh, just I'm not going to go over that because there's actually an offensive security course, 365 that goes into greater detail. But uh, since we're all here talking about this, just a brief overview of why you would do this and some of the things that 
go into it. The point of doing social engineering attacks in a penetration testing sense is all recon, it's intelligence gathering. It's absolutely essential in order to affect a successful attack. Attackers perform reconnaissance all the time. There's remote reconnaissance via things like open source investigative techniques, OSINT. Uh, but getting boots on the ground and actually being there physically in person matters a whole lot too, because there's you can find out so much more in person than you can uh, remotely. Now, all of this, of course, is done within a very well-defined, pre-agreed-upon uh, scope of where you can go to, what you're trying to achieve, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And of course, you never, ever violate that because that's a professional and ethical snafu. You don't want to find yourself, and the last thing you want to do is end up doing time because you walked through the wrong door because you had vague engagement. So that's all that work is done ahead of time. And it's also important, if you're gonna be doing this, of course, most people that are gonna be working in there aren't gonna be aware of who you are because it kind of defeats the purpose of hiring a penetration testing company. Um, or in some cases, of course, internal pen testing is done. Um, so it is important to, to make sure that you have clearance and that you have some kind of uh, you know, way of saying, officer, check my back pocket. I have a letter, I'm a pen tester. This is agreed upon kind of a thing. Um, I have never been arrested uh, out on any jobs that I ever did. Um, as in, I've never been charged and booked and everything like that. Have I, have I been cuffed and put in the back of a squad car? Yeah, on a couple of occasions, you know, it happens. Um, right, uh, and what you're trying to achieve, of course, it's all about reconnaissance. So you're looking for not just um, the physical targets, but also for future remote uh, computer vector attacks. You can learn a lot just from being in the building, seeing you know, how old their endpoints are, what OS are they running, uh, do they lock their computers when they leave? Actually, hold on a second, I have a couple of slides that go through those a little bit more detail. So uh, areas of risk and then tactics that you might use to get in. So for example, your reception area is supposed to be the gateway for all public. That's where you have your first security zones internally. It's where there's gonna be the boundary maintenance mechanism, which is usually going to be the receptionist. Now, receptionists are not security guards, they're not meant to be, but just the act of having someone there acts as a deterrent against most people who might try to slip past them. Unless, of course, you're you know, versed enough to, to exploit that vulnerability. Um, so out at reception, you might have to worry about something about like impersonation or persuasion. Somebody coming in there and saying they're a contractor uh, or, a uh, new hire or uh, an existing employee or something like that. Um, I never, I didn't do this one, but I did, <clears throat> I did work uh, with other uh, covert entry people, one of which was a social engineering specialist uh, who actually went on to uh, write a couple of books on the subject. Uh, and he was really good. Uh, he's one of those guys who could uh, uh, sell a ketchup popsicle to a woman in white gloves. He, he just he would talk, people would listen, and I I don't get it. But um, I watched him. Um, we were sitting in the reception area, uh, and we were basically there. And I was I was on a laptop. I think I was scanning their public Wi-Fi or something like that. Um, but we were mostly just sitting in their lobby uh, rather than sitting outside uh, because we wanted to see how long we could sit there before somebody asked us if they could help us or something like that. And we were there for like an hour or something like that. Um, and uh, eventually he was just, he was getting bored and he was just like, you know what, uh, I'm gonna try something. Um, so he goes up there and he talks to the receptionist for like five minutes and then he gets buzzed in. Uh, and so I follow behind him, I tailgate him, right? A tailgating is when somebody who's authorized goes through a door and somebody else just kind of follows behind him. So I tailgate him and I'm in there. And I'm like, what the hell did you do? Uh, and the, while I was sitting there scanning for that hour, he was looking around at the receptionist and he saw that there was some birthday cards in the back. She had just gotten a, a birthday cards so like signed by the other people in the department and stuff like that. And he said that he went up there and he talked to her. He asked her uh, how he did uh, old mentalist tricks. You know, if you've ever seen like um, John Edwards or something like that, we'll be like, okay, I'm, I'm getting a, I'm getting a, a sense here. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a name. Is someone over here? Uh, you know, anybody who starts with the name M, M, okay, M, is it Mike? Is it Mary? Is it Matt? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, so anyway, he goes up there. He's like uh, talking to her about her birthday, asked her 
you know, did you like uh, those flowers that you got? And he made a mistake. She didn't get flowers. And I was like, what are you talking about? I, we chipped in on flowers. Anyway, long story short, talked his way back in there, simply by ingratiating himself with her and uh, using just what he could see from the lobby in order to make it seem as if he belonged there. Um, you also uh, do have to worry about covert entry through building entrances. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned in this class or another class, but I've worked at places before that just have a tremendous amount of e-waste that they just toss into a dumpster, a dumpster secured behind a gate with a lock that's not locked, right? Just sitting there, just waiting for somebody to come along and take it. I was working at this place over the holidays because of course, if you're a cybersecurity professional, you can forget about taking holidays off uh, because that's when attacks happen. But I was there um, during the holidays, go to throw something out in the dumpster, I open it up, laptops. It's all laptops, like 60 laptops. So I grab a random one off the top, still got the battery in it, still got the drive in it, turn it on, battery still powered. And what do I see? CEO's uh, username, right? Would have been a treasure trove for anybody who had gone looking. Um, and locks, doors in general, just almost always insanely easy to defeat one way or another. Uh, but anyway, the point is uh, unauthorized physical access is something that you have to do. But if you do that, of course, you might get caught and then you end up having to come up with a quick uh, social engineering attack in order to get away or to talk your way in. Uh, in the office environment, shoulder surfing, uh, um, Places without clean desk policies will have sensitive information just sitting out in the open with nobody sitting at their desk. You just walk by and take a look. Um, just getting job titles and stuff or, or just listening for water cooler talk. You find out that uh, you, know, you have a list, like an employee directory or something like that, but then you find out uh, that somebody on your directory was recently terminated or uh, moved departments or something like that, that's a good opportunity. You overhear that kind of intel, you know that within the organization, there's gonna be at least a small amount of confusion that you may be able to exploit. Something like you give them a call now and you say, uh, hey, I was uh, contracted by uh, somebody I'm, I'm trying their number and I'm not getting a reply to my emails. John Doe, VP of security. Oh, he's no longer with the company. Oh, okay, well, we're already been contracted. We're gonna come back out today to finish this job. Okay, you know, they don't know necessarily what's going on. Um, and then of course, uh, just straight up stealing documents and stuff. Uh, if it's out there, it can be taken. Anyway, um, essentially what you're doing is you're doing research. Um, once you're inside a, a building, usually it's a lot easier to do other remote vector attacks. So for example, perimeter security is usually pretty tight, but most places don't really operate off of a zero trust platform, meaning that once you're inside the wire, you're inside the wire and you're considered a trusted member of the family, right? So you can just kind of plug into an open port and scan to your heart's content with very little in your way. And it allows you to gather all kinds of information you wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. Um, it uh, gets you an in, right? If you Get in, you know the layout of the place, you can map it out, come back later when nobody is around in order to do more work. Judge the basic level of security of the place. Like are people remembering to hit Windows L when they leave or are they just walking away, leaving their email open on, uh, on their computer? Um, more than one time in order to, because when you're, when you're doing a pen test, you, you need to provide a report, um, but it's also kind of considered well, okay, I'm not going to say it's like good business, uh, but executives don't read reports, right? They're like six-year-olds. They want the colors and the lights, and if it makes noise, it's even better. Um, so you can write a report. That's usually what you're contracted to do. But when you're doing the executive debrief, usually you want to have some kind of like, wow, kind of a thing, you know, uh, whether that's, you know, you uh, walk into the place uh, and you know pull out you know tons of padlocks you were able to pick in order to get your way in there. Um, one of the ones that I used before that uh, really seemed to work uh, is I would wait for the uh, executive I was going to be debriefing to leave their office, 
They go to the bathroom. I head in and I send myself an email from them because they left their damn computer unlocked with the Outlook application open. So I send myself an email uh, that says something, you know, like to the effect of, well, you know, wiring myself six million dollars. Right? You show them that, and they're like, "Oh, I should probably have locked my computer." Yes, that's why we're here. We should have. It's written here. Um, and you also get a good idea of uh, what else you're going to need, right? Um, what versions people are running, uh, what potential exploits are out there, vulnerabilities. You just get a good inside look. Uh, the kind of thing like in a black box testing, you know absolutely nothing. Uh, and if you can get inside, you can learn a lot about the way a company is operating, uh, the packages they prefer, their hardware stack. It's all potentially useful information. And you can't really get it in any better way than actually doing it. Uh, the reason that it works, as we talked about last time, one of the reasons that training fails is because number one, it's always training a very specific schema. Uh, you know, usually like a student schema or maybe like uh, employee training schema or something like that. And by the time people get back to their desk, they've forgotten all about it or they're just in a different schema and that schema happens to be more helpful uh, than, uh, than others. Um, and the reason for that is, again, what we're essentially exploiting when we're talking about social engineering is we're talking about exploiting vulnerabilities in systems. Humans have systems. Uh, we are social creatures. We want to help each other, of course. And so if somebody needs help, most of the time people are willing to extend a hand uh, as long as it doesn't impose upon them too much, I guess. Uh, but also people fear authority. Uh, I talked about the bank job last time. Um, where we got to a certain point with the bank uh, uh, staff there. Um, it was the office manager because the branch manager was out. And they were out because we chose a time when we knew they'd be out because they seemed like a hard ass. Um, he was one of those guys who uh, probably shines his head in the morning, had his cell phone on his hip. Um, one of those uh, key fob things on his belt that has badge on it. Uh, he seemed like a hard ass. I just didn't want to deal with him. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, yeah, right. So we got, we got to a certain point with her, but um, you know, after a while, she was like, "This is starting to sound a little bit suspicious, a little bit hinky." So I pull out the old uh, failure or or not failure, <laughs> refusal of service thing, uh, and gave the fire and brimstone speech about this being a security incident. And if you don't let us fix us, that fine, but we're not taking any responsibility uh, for it. Uh, it's just the fear of the authority, the fear that they're making a mistake that something is wrong. Because, you know, we all, we all want to be accepted, so we all want to help. We all want security, so we fear authority. You know? uh, and, you know, sometimes people will just give things up because it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, right? We looked at the art of deception last time. We learned about how information can snowball. Social engineering attacks, like most attacks, are an iterative process. You learn a little bit each time. You use what you learn to get more information, right? Um, and uh, most people aren't even on the lookout for stuff that's really all that unusual, right? We're, we're trained to notice the big things that happen, right? If uh, somebody drives into the side of the building with an armored car and comes out, you know, with wielding guns and saying, you know, your money or your life, yeah, we'll notice that. Uh, but if somebody just kind of slips in, you know, behind us, are you really going to turn around and be like, hey, this is a security issue. Present your identification. And that's not really something that raises many red flags. And if it does, you know, we just assume somebody else will handle it. It's not our jobs. So it's effective. That's why it works out so much. Usually with phishing attacks, uh, this one is the most important thing. Because that initial attack, I'm just clicking a link. They just want to know my name. They just want to know if I'm interested in this job. None of this is sensitive information. But again, it snowballs. It's iterative. Um, or, you know, if we click that link, you know, maybe we don't think anything of it. And if we end up on a site that looks official, maybe we don't even look any closer. All right, so typically on an engagement like this uh, for an on-site observation, what you're uh, going to do, it's, it's, it's almost never going to be just a one and done kind of thing because it is a process. Um, whenever I would work on uh, teams doing physical pen testing, um, usually our team was between four and six people. Uh, we would usually have uh, phishing campaigns running uh, or vishing or smishing or whatever technology they used. Um, we would uh, usually have uh, not necessarily, it depends on the place, but not necessarily 24 hour surveillance, but we would 
have shifts where we would surveil at different times to try and learn the patterns of security guards and stuff. Uh, but it's a combination of physical recon, OSINT, phishing attacks, and scanning, and so on, to try and get information from multiple different ways. It was never just one thing that led to a successful operation. There's always multiple things contributing together. And in terms of social engineering, uh, usually there's several different layers. There's the actual physical perimeter of the building, uh, networks, because... Getting access to a building is one thing, but being able to like go into a janitor's closet and plug into a switch, I mean, it's not so hard here because we keep them on the wall, but at other places, they're slightly more secure. So you kind of need to elevate a little bit. If we were to equate this to a computer system, you have to elevate your privileges in order to gain access to additional resources. So the perimeter of the building, that's not usually that bad. Uh, depending on where you're going, access to networking equipment is a little bit higher up. But if you really want to get access to like the data center or something, that's usually the most difficult part, or, or at least it's, it ought to be if they're doing things right. And uh, there are plenty of other talks out there. Actually, I would recommend um, if you're interested in physical pen testing, uh, not so much social engineering, uh, but there is somebody who goes out to cons all the time. Uh, Deviant Olaf, uh, but that's uh, uh, Gaelic, so it's actually O-L-L-A-M, Olam is how it's spelled, uh, who does a lot of talks at security conferences, and I think he's got a YouTube channel, he talks a lot about physical security, and does a couple of things about gaining access to places using social engineering, although he himself is not a social engineering expert. But if you are interested in, in that kind of thing, some of the things, the tools of the trade, of course, uh, you know, the fake badges, your fake work orders, business cards. Um, usually what you carry depends a lot on the job. That's part of the reason why you're doing reconnaissance, so you know what you need to carry. Uh, this is an example of a spy cable. Um, one, uh, whenever we had, uh, so your objective changes depending on what the client wants, of course. So sometimes it's something like gain access to the data center, but sometimes it's something like gain uh, an administrator password for this database. And uh, in those cases, we might use like a little USB rubber ducky. We would gain access to the building. We would find the administrator's workstation and we would plug in the rubber ducky in line with the keyboard. Or we would just use one of these cables here. It's just, you can see it's you just insert a little card in there and then the uh, cover slips over it. You plug that in, they'll plug their phone into it. It works just fine, but it's also eavesdropping. That's a spy cable. Stuxnet, right? The it's the uh, um, malware attack that took down uh, the Iranian um, uranium refinement facility a number of years ago. Uh, that was done with a social engineering attack. Uh, what they did in that case is they went to a restaurant near the refinement facility and they dropped USB drives just randomly in the restaurant. You know, like they would go there for lunch. And they would leave it on the windowsill or somewhere innocuous where people might notice it, but it's not really obvious. And of course, at lunchtime, workers at the facility would go out to lunch at that restaurant because it was nearby, find the USBs, bring them back to work. I want to see what's on them. There could be porn on it or something. I got to know right now at work, of course, which is how they were able to achieve that attack, despite the fact that those nuclear refinement centrifuges uh, were actually air gapped. There was no external access. You had to be there sitting at the terminal in order to make that work. Um, and um, a covert entry kit couldn't hurt. Uh, I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna skip over that because that's really a, a 365 topic. But suffice to say, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll go in with special stuff. Whatever it takes to really sell the legend, to really get access. A Proxmark, for example, a um, couple of times I did this trick. So everyone's familiar, at least ostensibly, with um, RFID readers, badges, and so on. Um, well, um, the readers, uh, essentially what they'll do is they just generate an electromagnetic field. The card comes within a certain distance of it, and you're able to read information off the card. That's the short version. A prox mark is one of those readers. And what I would do is I would put it inside a... Um, a folding clipboard uh, running off of a battery pack and just dumping whatever it reads onto the flash drive. And uh, I would go up there and, of course, look in the part. You got to wear the hard hat, the high-vis vest. You got to you know, have the, the tool belt and everything. 
uh, you come out there and, and you say, you just go up to the security guard right at the gate uh, and say, you know, is this this facility? I have a work order here. They, of course, want to see your identification. And then you say, hey, I also have my own work order. I got to fill out. I got a report here that I talked to somebody. Um, what's your name? No matter what, even if their name is John Smith. Say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. John, what? What? Do you, can I see your, can I just get your ID? Can I just write it down? I hand you your ID. It's in plain view the whole time. You're not stealing it from them because that would make them really uncomfortable and tip them off. But you set that on your clipboard while you're writing it down on a fake work order and the prox mark beneath the clipboard will read it. And then you have a security guard's ID, all right? Um, Wi-Fi pineapples for rogue APs too. Uh, I used to go into places and uh, plant rogue APs behind potted plants and stuff. Uh, rogue APs, just um, devices will connect to it and then you're eavesdropping in on their networking traffic. Um, stuff like that. Uh, but the most important thing on here, as a matter of fact, and I know I said I wasn't going to go into this because it's a 365 topic, but fuck it, I'm doing it anyway, I guess, uh, is, uh, is this uh, a, good, a good camera. Uh, if you can sit across the street and you can take pictures of the locks that are on the doors, then you know exactly what you need to put in your covert entry kit. You know exactly what pick you need or shim you need uh, or uh, if you need an impressioning kit or some other crazy stuff, right? The camera is always the most important thing. Uh, we always used to wear um, button cameras and stuff as well when we went in, just in case we didn't see something, but we would go back and watch the footage later. And then we would see uh, the elevator, for example, is running in service mode. That's good news for us. More than once, I've gone into a place, gone into the elevator, and used a standard FEOK1 key to turn it into service mode, and then just sat in the elevator all day waiting for everyone to go home so that I could come out and do my work. All right, so uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I probably should have not diverged into that area so much because it's less important for this class, but fuck it, whatever. Um, more importantly, what can be done about these kinds of things? Of course, training is the answer in the industry for this, but we do training generally in a pretty terrible way. Most of the time when we're talking about training to people, we try to keep it as simple as possible because we want that, we, we know impulsively or intuitively rather, uh, that the loose lips sink ships type of messaging is greatest, the most psychologically effective and memorable, but um, it's also really hard to do. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not easy to come up, you know, people in cybersecurity aren't marketing professionals. Uh, they're not Bernaysian psychologists or advertising executives, so it's really hard to do. So generally our training focuses on the right areas. If you've taken cybersecurity training before, these were probably the topics, you know, if you had to. It's always passwords, uh, handling confidential information, physical security, like don't open the door for people if they don't belong there. Make sure that you have your badge. Don't let anyone who doesn't have a badge in. And if you bring somebody on site for whatever reason, never let them out of your site kind of a thing. And maybe if you have somebody who's really gung-ho about the training, you might have something like, you know, remember that you can be tracked with your phone uh, or remember that your personal device if used for business purposes is considered a business device and stuff, stuff like that. Just the, the random things depending on the organization that might be required. But none of that ever really sticks. Uh, the passwords one might uh, at this point in time, although you know, I guarantee even those of you in here in the cybersecurity track, you probably also do the, oh, my university password is expired. It's time to use the same exact password, except increment the last number by one. I know I've been here six semesters because I'm on seven or whatever. Um, <laughs> it's just the impulse, right? Because what we're fighting in all of cybersecurity, of course, is universal entropy. And for the human system that we exploit with social engineering, entropy takes the form of the path of least resistance, right? People want quick, they want easy, they want the results without as much work. And that's normal because our human systems are designed to do evaluations and transaction costs or opportunity costs. If we do one thing, we can't do another. That's an opportunity cost. If we do one thing, it's this much work, but if we do the other thing, it's much less work. Therefore, thing B is better. It's just normal psychology. That's how we're kind of wired. There are really, at the end of the day, only two guiding principles that govern human behavior. 
One is the avoidance of discomfort, and the other is the avoidance, or sorry, the pursuit of comfort. Unless, I guess, maybe if you have some kind of trauma or something, maybe you avoid comfort as well. And if so I feel sorry for you, seek help, but it's usually avoidance of discomfort, pursuit of comfort. So our training uh, is kind of designed around that as well, right? We either use training in a punitive fashion, like if you screw up, you have to do more training. That is discomfort, people will avoid it and do the right thing. Or we ask them to pursue comfort, essentially by saying, get the training over with, you won't have to deal with it again, unless you have some other kind of problem. But it's, it's almost never really done effectively in a way that actually plays to comfort. And of the two, the avoidance of discomfort is compelling, but just like with any other animal, uh, Pavlov's dogs, for example, right? What motivated them in a classical conditioning kind of sense, not that people are as simple as all of this, um, but you can have Pavlov's dogs and you can hit them until they take a treat and then stop. <laughs> or you can ring the bell, give them a treat, and they associate the pursuit of comfort with the ringing of the bell. It's far more motivating to pursue comfort than it is to avoid discomfort because to avoid discomfort, we will essentially do the bare minimum required to avoid discomfort. Whereas we're usually willing to go much farther in the pursuit of comfort. So what I'm saying is, is that all of our training is more or less built around this avoidance of discomfort. So it just doesn't stick, at least not any more than it needs to uh, in order to avoid that. And the other problem we have with training as I hinted to before, uh, is that it almost is always fact-based. We are using the hard tactic of rationalization and legitimating in order to convey our message most of the time uh, in corporate security. And we do that, again, because we consider ourselves to be rational people, and so we think if we can just explain well enough and provide enough information, people will convert information into understanding, into knowledge, and then we've done our job. But people just simply aren't motivated by that very much. And at the end of the day, most failings in training aren't because people don't know what the right thing to do is, it's that they're willing to do the wrong thing for very little incentive. There have been actually studies done, at, at, uh, there was one presented at DEF CON about six or seven years ago. Uh, a couple of security researchers wanted to find out what is the absolute minimum favor somebody is willing to trade for information. And it was shocking how easy people are. There's some cheap dates out there for a pen or a chocolate, people would be willing to give them the last four of their social because it doesn't seem like important information. It's just the last four. I give that to my bank all the time. I give that to my doctor all the time or what have you. Um, it just doesn't seem like as important information, certainly not as important as the whole thing. I need two chocolate bars for that. Uh, but um, yeah, it's shocking how little it takes at times. And that's not a failing necessarily because I mean, if I walk up to any random person on the street and I just, let's say I use the hardest tactic that we look at, a request. If I just come up to somebody and say, what's the last word of your social? I'm not gonna get that information. Well, probably. <laughs> Again, chemistry dictates that there probably is gonna be a couple of people out there that's be like, I like you. Yes, my last four, no problem. Um, but <laughs> for the most part, uh, that's not how it works. But if I, what if I legitimate? What if I use a slightly softer tactic but still a hard tactic I'm carrying a clipboard uh, and I say, I'm conducting a survey, people walking up here and down. Did you know the last four of your social is associated with the place and year of your birth? So I bet I can guess when you were born uh, and where if you give me the last four of your social, right? So I got my clipboard, I look like I'm official, I write it down, I think real hard for a couple seconds, I give an answer, it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong because I'm not actually doing what I told them I'm doing, uh, but I'm likely to get more responses that way. But what if I say, if, you, if you're a good sport, if you're playing along, I give you a dollar. I'm gonna get a lot more responses. I just will. Uh, that's because it's not that they don't know it's wrong, it's that people are willing to bend the rules, especially for people that they like, uh, sometimes for people that they're afraid of, uh, and we don't teach to ethics, right? We don't make it a core principle. We don't get so far as to use softer tactics like personal appeals or inspirational appeals. We don't say to people, uh, that our organization depends on you specifically, that we know that you're moral upright people, that giving out information or letting people in when you shouldn't is wrong. And there'll be certain people who will violate that anyway, 
but that would be more effective, at least according to the research that we have. We also don't ever have, um, while cybersecurity professionals also often deal with privacy and compliance, all of which are ethical imperatives for organizations, very rarely um, do we um, explicitly assign that duty to them. It's more of in a business sense, we have to act ethically or we will be uh, sued, fined, something like that. Um, and so not having that kind of authority um, actually ends up undermining us anyway, because most of the reports that we get in cybersecurity are constituency calls, constituency reports, people who reach out and say that they've seen something or even done something in certain cases, um, and they knew who to call. Right? They, they knew who to take these ethical quandaries to. There's somebody who's calling here. They say that they're a vendor. Uh, they're really nice. I want to help them out. Uh, is it okay to do this? You almost never get that call unless your training specifically deals with ethical issues. Right? Um, da, 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 da. Yeah. All right. So we are going to uh, briefly uh, watch. Oh. Shit, we're already almost out of time. All right, we should have time for this. Um, we're going to watch uh, very briefly here a scam baiter goes by the name of Kid Boga. Uh, while watching it, we probably won't have time to discuss it today, but we'll push this topic off to next week, at least one more day anyway. When we're watching it, try to identify those tactics and see what they're, they're doing in order to, the scammers are doing in order to get what they want. See what tactics Kit Boga, the scan baiter, does in order to stave off. And his goal, of course, is to keep them on the phone as long as possible. But before we actually watch that, just a little bit of a background here on what you're about to see. Uh, so scam baiting is actually, it's a low effort, low investment attack. It's about as low as you can possibly get in terms of scamming people for money. Um, but it is a big business and it's a big business because it actually works off of some pretty sound social engineering principles prior to contact with a victim. So usually by the time the call that you're about to witness with Kitboga has occurred, Kitboga has already had to interact with a number of different systems in order to end up in that position because social engineering works best when you know your audience. If that hasn't been clear so far, there it is, as explicit as I can possibly make it. What you want, if you want the low effort attack to succeed, is you need a victim that's willing to fall for a low effort attack. If you have a victim that won't fall for a low effort attack, that means you have to put more effort into it, more verisimilitude into your, into your pretext, and so on. This is a flow chart for this kind of attack, right? And it's basically a way of weeding out victims who would not be susceptible to these low effort attacks. Now, Kit Boga is impersonating somebody who would fall for this. He himself does not, which is why he does what he does. Usually, it begins with a simple phishing message, usually something that's like 99% of people aren't going to fall for it and they're just going to ignore. Um, they also don't want to deal with people who don't have enough tech savviness to click the link, so it weeds those people out too. If they click the link in the phishing email, it sends them to a web page. That web page will have a pop-up or an ad or something like that that usually says something like, warning, Microsoft Defender has located several infections on your machine, usually in much worse English than that. Not that, that would be great. Um, but that alone isn't enough. They, they know that the link has been clicked. They control that server. They know that, that there's visitors showing up. But that's not good enough, all right? They want people who will also click the pop-up. If they click the pop-up, it sends them to something like a Google form or Microsoft forms document that says, um, you know, something like a security engineer will contact you in order to help you deal with this infection. Just put your name and your phone number and hit submit. We'll contact you within a business day or something like that. If they don't participate with that, then they don't want them as a victim either because they're not willing to do anything in order to perpetuate the attack. So they get thrown into the, the round file. They just ignore them. If they fill out the form and submit it, then they'll get spear fished. So they'll send them an email. It'll say something like, hello. And now they have their name. So they use their name and keep it personal. And at this point, they have not invested any actual human resources in any individual victim. It's not until here that there's probably a person whose whole job 
is to respond to these things and send out emails to schedule calls with security engineers. So they'll send out a spearfish, hello, Julia, we see that you have a problem. You have three infections on your computer. Uh, are you willing to set up a call with a security engineer? And if they reply, then they can proceed. If they don't, then it means that they're not interacting or they don't, again, know how to use computers well enough to make it work. If they reply, then they've got what is known in the industry as a sheep. At DEF CON, there is a scrolling marquee and a projector with usernames and passwords they call the wall of sheep, which are people who went to DEF CON and didn't turn their phone off and they got their credits. <laughs> so a sheep is just a term. Uh, I guess it's not a nicer term now that I think of it. <laughs> I was about to say it's a nicer term than sucker, <laughs> but that's what it is. And as a matter of fact, in the industry, the marketing industry, there's things called sucker lists. If you end up on a sucker list, you're the one who's going to get all of the um, donate five cents to save the sea turtles or something like that. Uh, not that donating to charity is a bad thing, but they're scam charities is what I'm trying to say. So you'll be getting all kinds of uh, uh, pamphlets and stuff soliciting you for money. It means you're on the sucker list. Uh, I, I avoided the sucker list for 30 years. And then uh, my, uh, <laughs> my late wife's parents signed me up for a subscription service for something. And now I'm getting all this shit because I'm on the sucker list. So if they call the sheep and they answer, then they've got a fish on the line and they can reel them in, right? And once they reel them in once, they're going to be on that sucker list and they're going to be getting calls all the time. Just one scam's not enough. They'll call back in a couple of weeks and try and do it again. But also, just like in the real uh, legitimate world, big data being a thing, there is a black market for data too. And lists of sheep are bought and sold all the time amongst these companies. So you'll actually get scam calls from all kinds of different people who are sharing the information about people who are essentially gullible suckers. All right, we got a couple of minutes. Let's see what we see here. Uh, that looks good. As always, is a scam. I think this YouTube premium stuff is a good example of avoidance of discomfort not really working. Uh, this is obviously much longer than we have, so I might skip around a little bit. Appreciate you attending. You gotta catch the detail along the way. Like quite a few scams these days, it all starts with a phone call. What do you find me familiar with? Hello, this is Matt, and I am calling you from the refunds department. And this call is in regard to your refund of three hundred ninety-nine dollars. The first half hour or so of me convince you that I'm going to connect your computer, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but. Hey, if you're interested in getting $399, maybe you'll throw cock into the wind that allows them to connect. Do you have your free card the number nine? Wait a minute. Free card number nine. I hope you enjoyed the story. It's all of the top theory. Okay, who is the phone to the number nine? Hold on. Yes, now, yes, I am going for a case. Well, the timer up in the upper right hand corner, by the way, is how long he's been on the phone with him. So you can keep your eyes on that and see how long it goes on. Shall I 
Remember, his goal is to keep the scammer on the phone as long as possible. All right. So everything's going okay so far. The scammer seems to be pretty patient, using fairly soft tactics in order to uh, kind of guide this along a little bit. Kiboga, of course, doing everything he possibly can to uh, drag things out. Let's go forward a little bit to see if the... Uh, no, we've definitely lost our cool at this point. So one of the things I decided to cut from this unit that we've talked about before in this class is specific tactics, uh, the uh, pen or chocolate in exchange for information, for example, uh, is an example of the quid pro quo. Do something for me, I'll do something for you. That's what he's using right there. Just enter your username and password and then I'll listen to you jabber on all you want, you old lady, it's fine. Oh, 
So he's not getting what he wants. He's losing his cool. Uh, if you didn't catch it, I'll give you one of the tactics that he used there. He was legitimating, and the problem with legitimating is that it's easy to rationalize away if it doesn't make any sense. So we can't transfer this without you logging in because of the way our business works. Well, other businesses can do this. Why can't you kind of a thing? Uh, we're at an hour and almost an hour and 20 minutes into this thing. Push forward here until after the login. All right. I said, do you get red? Do you get red right now? Today is Tuesday. Sorry, Monday. Sorry. <laughs> I Monday. It's Monday. Yeah, it's Monday. Yeah, That's actually a really good spot to to uh, point out there. Kid Boga knew that it wasn't Tuesday, obviously. Why didn't he answer when he knew it was wrong? Because he didn't want to give the scammer the impression that this old woman had any idea what the hell day it was to begin with, all right? If he had answered, then it would have known that he may have, might have been a little bit more with it than he seems. He's walking a fine line. He doesn't want to seem competent at all. The scammer was eating on the phone not that long ago in this video. I have to fit my wife bathroom. 
I have to give time to them in the house. I do have mother, father, eat with me. Everybody oh, will be there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you got to admit, that's kind of a brutal tactic right there because he knows he's scamming old people, right? I mean, they got to feel a certain way about that. And in a way, he's, he's speaking directly to them. Hold on a sec. I want to push forward a little bit uh, to show first the turn here um, because these attacks, in order to rationalize and legitimate them, they will actually make it seem as if they have made a terrible mistake and accidentally transferred too much money. That's how the scam works. You were owed $3.99, and then at some point in the process, uh, because they're connected with like TeamViewer or something like that, they'll blank out the screen and just edit the HTML and the developer tools of the browser and make it look like they transferred $13.99 instead. Um, Um, I'm not sure where that happens, but okay. Anyway, this would be after that point where there's been a mistake. And now I'm going to lose my job if you don't send me the $1,000 I accidentally sent you over what you were refunded. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of the tactics we were talking about, the study that we showed said there's acquiescence and then there's compliance and then there's actual joining. At this point, it's taken quite a bit of convincing just to get acquiescence. And this is actually a really important part in the scam because this is the first time where they're hoping that they're able to manipulate the target enough to get them to go the extra mile and actually leave their house and go and buy gift cards in order to send the money back. And they've been on the phone for two hours, by the way. Now, a scammer doesn't want to let her off the phone. A scammer lets her off the phone, she, he might lose her. So put me on speaker. Let's drive to the Dollar General right now. Whatever, okay. Uh, I want to reach the parking lot. Just to let me know that yes, honey, I am in the parking lot. Okay. Okay. You are in the parking lot. Yeah, I am in the parking lot right over here. Uh, okay. And which door you are in right now? Which parking lot, which door parking lot you are in right now? Yeah. Yep. The going to shop. Any of the tools? What do we want now? You just go. No, go to the one we just take the 500. Google Play, yes, pass. Google Play. If they ask you for a reason, for a security purpose, for what purpose you purchasing this, this gift card, okay? Just have to tell them it's for my personal use. I want to give this to my children or grandchildren, whatever you can say, okay? And this is a failure in training, an ethical violation. 
it's just a little white lie. You're just helping out somebody you've been talking to for two and a half hours. <laughs> and he's just asking you to bend the rules a little bit and giving a perfectly good reason for why you have to tell a little white lie because the store won't let you otherwise. All right, we're running low on time, so I won't rob you of uh, the exciting conclusion. Benefiber might, though. Yes. All right. Back from the Walgreens with the play Google Play gift cards. Oh, uh, yeah, hold on. Actually, uh, let me explain one more thing about Kid Bogus setup here. Obviously, he uh, does this a lot. He streams on Twitch all the time doing this. Um, so he's got the costumes and the green screen and everything and the voice changer and all that. Uh, the most important tool that he uses, however, is this virtual machine. It's very specially configured for scam baiting. Uh, so when he visits a site, it's not the actual site. It's a site he created that looks like it and it will function similarly, but it doesn't actually refund anything. These aren't real cards. Remember, he doesn't know that this Google Play phone is fake. Madam, Madam, type the card number here, the promo code. Don't click on reading, okay? Don't click on reading. Keep the number out here, but don't click on reading. Four hours. And this is four hours after they should have closed, so. Madam, why are you adding on your Google Play? Why do you need the number? No, no, no. Do not trust, madam. Do not trust. All right. This is the second card number, right? $800, right? $800. He doesn't even notice there's a mistake. You see how it said $100? His VM has it so that if the 
number starts with a certain character, that's the value of the card. And he grabbed the wrong number. He grabbed a hundred dollar one instead of a five hundred one. But he's so mad he doesn't even notice. You have to give it to me. So Matt I didn't even notice that the yeah, the number was your scam over here. All right, that's uh that's it for today. Uh, the link is on Canvas if you want to watch the full thing. Kidboga is great. Uh, he does this like stalling tactic because that it doesn't violate the TOS for Twitch or YouTube. Uh, but if you're interested in a scam baiter or scam fighter uh, that actually does do stuff that would not be allowed other places, check out Jim Browning. He actually hacks back on scammers. Take it easy. See you. Yeah. <clears throat>